The Connection Show, inspiring hope, health, and healing, sponsored by Brave Heart Workshops, live with Jill Reynolds. And I am in San Marcos, California, at the General Flynn Reawakening Conference with Clay Clark. And I have had the privilege today to just have Brian, Dr. Brian Artis, walk into the media room and be my guest. Welcome, Brian. We're so excited to be here. Thanks for finally putting me at your table. Well, I'm I've been excited. waiting like a year to yep. get interviewed by you. Well, I met you in Branson, Missouri at the Determined Patriots event with Doug Billings. That was a phenomenal event. It surely was. I loved it. And we have we have an old friend that we know, Dr. Joe Mercola. Oh, yeah. Joseph Mercola. Mercola. What a guy. He's on the top of, like, the CCHR's, uh, you know, Hit list. most hated person on the planet. Yeah. Well, well, Brian, we do things a lot different on my show than what you're used to. Well, I mean, a Hershey kiss, that's already different. Well, that's all right. It's all right. So <laughs> it's you, all right different for me. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that we do on this show is I truly have been inspired by God. Um, that when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, Brian, he loved to share stories, accounts, and parables for the sole purpose of transformation in people's lives. And he barely ever went up and did a sermon, but he surely knew how to share stories and accounts and parables really well. And so with that, I really do believe that everyone has an amazing story that's been hand-printed on everyone's life for the sole purpose of transforming other people's lives. So what I'd love for you to do, if you're willing, and your wife's looking, so she'll probably laugh, is I want to know if you're willing to be transparent and go deep and talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life growing up and start with little Brian and share with us your journey growing up and what struggles and pains you went through. Sure. All right. So I was uh, raised in the Mormon church. That's basically where it all starts. My parents were living in New Orleans at the time. They were visiting my grandparents in Utah when I was born. Lived there a couple weeks and then moved back to New Orleans. I'm the oldest of five children. We moved almost every year and a half or two years of my entire life. My dad just would go from one career to the other, trying to move up the corporate ladder. Went from New Orleans to Florida to Georgia to South Carolina to Boston to California to Utah to Texas. Been all over the place. So most of my life, though, was actually centered around the Mormon church, which my family was fifth, sixth, seventh generation Mormon on both sides. Actually, on one side. But uh, anyway, I spent a lot of time doing stuff with the Mormon church, lots of it. So when I look at myself as a little kid, my favorite things were always animals. So I surrounded myself with animals. I, I really liked being alone more than anything else. So I loved a few things. I loved encyclopedias. For some reason, I was a nerd that way, even though I didn't want to call myself a nerd. But I loved encyclopedias and data sets. So I, I loved animals and wanted to be a marine biologist or a veterinarian, some of those things. I actually loved Jacques Cousteau, who was a marine biologist and created documentaries. So I would get any videos he created. And then I had this thing I subscribed to that would, they would send me like each month five cards of different animals and it would talk about their scientific names their species their habitat their geographical locations and i loved collecting that stuff i don't know why i just did instead of gi joe guys or or major league baseball cards that wasn't me yeah i was i was getting all the nerdy stuff and i really didn't have an appreciation to that until i became a doctor later on and even i'll just tell you so so i spent most of my time as a child going with animals, hanging out with animals. We had animals in Georgia, goats, horses, all kinds of stuff. So I actually would go out and read books to the goats before they went to bed at night. I would actually go read them stories from a book, <laughs> and the goats would just jump all around. That's what I spent most of my time doing. And then uh, when we moved to South Carolina, or no, when we moved to Atlanta, Georgia, the primary center of all my time came became basketball, and I loved basketball. Uh, it even got to be such a big deal that when I was a freshman in high school, I was actually put on the varsity team at a big 5A high school as a freshman. One of a few white guys on that team in Atlanta, Georgia. And were you on the A team, so you got to I play? I was, yep, I was on the A team. So I loved basketball and loved being on a court, and uh, I loved it. I mean, I loved it. I loved idolizing, tried to idolize and mimic all of the things Michael Jordan did on a court during that period. And I was dead set on being an NBA star one day. That was my goal. I'm going to be on these billboards with Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan. And, of course, you met all of those stars, right? Uh, no, I did not even meet them. 
but I loved them. I felt like I knew them after watching them on TV and buying every video and highlights. But no, I did not <laughs> ever meet them. However, have I met them? No. But my son did meet Kareem Abdul-Dabar and uh, Magic Johnson well, a couple I, years ago. I happen to have been in sales at the time Michael Jordan was with the Chicago Bulls. And I ended up uh, landing all of the sports teams' uh, accounts. So I had the Bulls, the Blackhawks, the Bears, the White Sox. I didn't get oh. the Cubs. And they all shipped with me. And so when the United Center uh, was being torn down and they were selling off all the seats and selling them, I did all the shipping. So I had everyone's home address. But not only did I have that, but I was fr I, my contact was the public relations director. So one year... I said, hey, could I get a gift for Jeremy for my son for, for Christmas? So he, he gave me a Jeremy Ronet autographed hockey stick. And then he said, well, here's an extra gift. And I got a Michael Jordan autographed basketball, oh, but I awesome. didn't have the letter of authenticity to go with it. Yeah. And then all kinds of pucks. So I, I got all the memorabilia. That's awesome. <laughs> but anyway, I, go ahead. I have met a ton of celebrity athletes and have lots of pictures with them and lots of signed autograph stuff. But... Now Michael Jordan. I think he's got enough money to not go to those events where they do autograph sessions and yep. pictures. Yep. So yeah, anyway, so when you were when you were moving all the all this time, Brian, and your your friends became the animals, like you said. Um, <laughs> no, no, yeah. I, I know I don't even look at that as a joke because when, true. You're, when you're moving so much and you're a quieter child, um, did you, do you feel like you experienced some some maybe inner uh, traumatic pain of having to try to connect and reconnect in all those cities you moved to. Yes. You, okay. I actually wouldn't even talk to anybody for the first three months. Because of fear? No, I just would sit and observe. and I just wanted to observe people and actually learn what their personalities and characteristics were. I was very observant that way. I would just watch kids interact with each other. And then I would decide who I wanted to befriend. No matter who was talking to me or trying to get me to engage with them, I would actually wait three or four months. And then I'd go talk to him and I kind of notice you're like that today yeah I actually will just sit back until people want to talk to me it's it's a really a funny thing but I will tell you I was absolutely aware even as a teenager as a teenager for sure that when people wanted to connect with me on a relationship level like be best friends or great friends I actually would say out loud don't get too close because I'm going to be leaving soon wow and then they would go well you're my best friend I literally would do this and I was like 10 11 12 They'd go, but you're my best friend. And I'd go, no, I'm not. And they'd go, yes, you are. And I'd go, no, I'm not. And they'd go, it doesn't matter where you go or where you move. We're still going to be best friends forever. And I'd go, no, the moment I leave, I say goodbye to everybody. And I'll never talk to you again. That's how it's been my whole life. And so there was like this ability to disconnect to people where I did not really connect with people. So how did that play out then? And I'm going to go really deep here with you. So how did sure. that play out? when you started to get interested in dating and then obviously you have a gorgeous beautiful wife <laughs> so how did that play out when you finally met the love of your life I think Jane's your first and only wife maybe you've had more have you had more than one I wife? actually was married once before so both her and I were married separately when we first ever met each other okay so was it what was it like then with that burden that you had carried from childhood to wonder if you could stay connected and not like disconnect immediately and says I can just like you this much but not all and, the way and then I can let you go I'm and not I kidding go. I had this ability oh, yeah. to disconnect and never even think about you again yeah so for me it was I just have to tell you in my life I always had this perspective and feeling 24 7 I still have it where no one is a stranger and I can talk to anybody I'm not sure if that's because there's some disconnect still sitting there that allows me to just do that, and it's not going to matter what you do or don't do. I'm still going to be fine, and I'm not going to attach. But there is a part of me that just thinks everyone is my best friend, and I act like we've no never not known each other, right? You like that double negative? We never not knew each other. So, so I have no, this ability. No, no one's going to hurt me. Right. There's kind of this thing where I actually am totally okay talking to anybody, anywhere. I'm super friendly to everybody. Like to check out in the grocery store, Jane will even say, she's like, how is it you can talk to everybody? Like anybody in line, I'll just start a conversation with them. I don't know. It's just how I am. So there's this part of me that's super friendly, loves to actually interact with people. I really do love human beings in general. Like I do love them. But I don't need them 
it feels like to constantly be talking to me mm-hmm. or visiting with me or being with me. I don't need them. Like, I don't need them that way. So I am very aware that even in relationships, friendships, courting, dating, it was very obvious to me that if they, if I was going to be great for them 24-7, which is what I tell myself every day, I'm going to be great for you. doesn't matter what it is. Always, I'm going to be great for you. I'm going to be great for you. Great for you. The problem with that is, is if they ever felt like they stabbed me in the back or were mean to me or be, betraying to me or try to belittle me, there was this immediate reaction of me to disconnect and to just let you go. And that drove everybody crazy. I mean, it drove all of them crazy mm-hmm. because I literally could say goodbye and walk off. And if you ask my wife, who is beautiful, sitting right there, ask her what's her greatest fear, it is that at some point in life I would disconnect and walk off. If she and, did one thing wrong and, and then I, it hurt you yeah, or something, she, you're like, yeah, okay. Ask her right now. Look, she's there. <laughs> you ever afraid that I'll just disconnect and walk off? Yeah, that's her yeah. biggest fear is that because yeah. she knows I have that in me to do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, But by far, Jane and I have an incredible relationship that I did not even know could exist ever and a connection that was beyond anything physical. It is a very metaphysical, spiritual. I actually believe I've known her for eternity. That's how wow. it feels. And that when I saw her, I felt like I recognized her spirit, mm-hmm. but didn't recognize her name. And I was very... Uh, Remember, I've never met a stranger in my life, but when I was introduced to her and met her in my waiting room as a patient, it literally was like I had known her forever, but not by her name, Jane. So I have I have something interesting to share with you and Jane. Yeah. So Larry and I, my husband, uh-huh. we, we met, believe it or not, at a codependency intensive retreat weekend. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Where, where he was trying to heal from, from his former wife's adulterous relationships and I was there healing from my codependency with my mom (laughs) and the very first exercise they had us do at this event was they had told us to pick someone in the room you know close by and to stand up and face to face non-verbally look into each other's eyes and determine who was the stayer and who was the lever in a relationship. This will be neat for you and Jane to do at home. I'm the lever. Uh, no, but wait, 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 hold it. So, so we did this exercise in this room, and Larry happened to be sitting next to me, so we, we did it together. So we're in the room with 30 people doing this exercise, so 15 people doing this, you know, couples doing it, and it didn't have to be a male and a, uh, a female. It could be just two males. Just to, You just were determining who's a, ma- a, f- a lever and stayer. So all of a sudden, I hear the therapist in the room say, by now someone has to make a decision who's the lever. Well, at that moment, we had been doing it for 15 minutes, Larry and I, so we knew that we were both stayers. <laughs> That's and we just we never, we never leave. So at that moment when he said, someone by now has to make a decision who's going to be the lever, Larry looked at me and says, well, I guess I'll have to since someone has to. So his eyes left me, and I immediately started crying and flash back to the time my mom was cheating on my father and while he was at work one day he she left him and he had no choice so when Larry had no choice to be a lever it brought me back and flashed me back but it was great because it helped me process that trauma sure. of him having to leave and so it's really a good exercise That's with really couples fun. to see <laughs> who stays and who leaves <laughs> I'll already tell you who I am and Jane will tell you who she is because she's uber loyal and doesn't want to leave yeah. yeah. well we're going to work on this one Brian I, I have some interesting good. things that we can do But let so let's move forward because um, we could stick on this subject forever so then how did so you loved these animals and you loved research and all this stuff so you became a chiropractor Yep. Not was that your I, next not, step? Not that I was going to do that, no. What happened? How did you become a chiropractor? So following the Mormon church, I actually went on a Mormon mission like I was told to from age 19 to 21. When you graduate high school, I was the good, perfect Mormon boy, followed all the rules. When I get back at age 21, my youngest sister, who's 11, is diagnosed with systemic lupus erythematosus. Mm. She had been through three hospitals with one-month stints at each of them. They came back and told us that the prognosis at the third hospital was this condition they called lupus. They also told my parents there's no known cause. There's no known cure. There's just these three drug options. These three drugs she has to live on for the rest of her life are called methyltrexate, Plaquenil, and prednisone. And those drugs will, over time, destroy her liver and her kidneys, and she most likely will not live into her 40s because she's so young with this condition. Also told her she would never have children because one of those drugs, methyltrexate, uh, 
causes stillbirths and birth defects, but she has to be on that for the rest of her life. This is when I decided that I was going to become a doctor because I told my parents, I'm not going to let doctors kill her because they don't know what's wrong with her and they don't know how to fix it. I mean, they flat out said, we don't know what this, we don't know how to fix it. We don't know what started to happen six months ago when her pain throughout her body started. So I decided I was going to become a doctor. Now, a few things that are really cool is that when I was a teenager, I loved the animals, but I actually saw a movie. That movie was called Patch Adams. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I I just met Patch uh, last week, two weeks ago. He was at a conference with me. That's awesome. Well, Patch Adams, I got to meet him in 2020, no, 2004. But uh, Patch Adams, when I watched the movie, I realized that there's a guy here who can have fun and joke around being a doctor. And I was like, wow, at least now I knew it was some kind of opportunity for me because I loved being a jokester. But I never met a medical doctor who actually looked like he was having fun being a doctor. They all Their lives totally seemed depressing to me. <laughs> so I never decided I was going to be a medical doctor. That I think that movie made it possible for me to think that I could be, though. So when my sister was diagnosed with lupus, I decided I was going to go find out how you heal somebody. And I thought I'd become a medical doctor. So I went off to prepare for med school, went to BYU, took pre-med classes, took the MCAT. Right around the time I, had the, I took the MCAT, my first son was born in Utah. And he had... From the time he was born and for four and a half months straight, it was nothing but screaming and crying, no bowel movements, colic, throwing up, everything nonstop, 24 hours a day. It's the most miserable time of my whole life. I actually reasoned then that I would never have a child again, ever, because this is not worth it. And every doctor said, this is normal. He'll grow out of it. And you didn't know it was his cranial bone. (laughs) And I had no idea that he was out of alignment in his neck (laughs) from birth using forceps. Mm -hmm. That's what I found found out four and a half months later. As a result of a chiropractor adjusting my kidney in five minutes, everything he dealt with for four and a half months disappeared. Mm -hmm. When I saw that guy lay his hands on my son and fix the problems, I decided then I wanted to know everything he knew to heal my kid. So I actually uh, called that chiropractor who adjusted my kid that I'd never knew anything about chiropractic for, and he called the president of Parker College of Chiropractic to call me and tell me about what chiropractic was. So that's when I dropped my enrollment to go to med school and went to chiropractic school. So I went to chiropractic school, then I was just fascinated with any idea of how you can heal somebody, because eventually, hopefully, I can get to my sister. So it was chiropractic school, acupuncture school, all at the same time, on the weekends and evenings. Graduated with both, and then went to Tennessee and started a practice, which evolved into an all-nutritional practice using muscle testing to identify the underlying causes of diseases. Uh, and then comes full circle while I'm in Tennessee, God actually says out loud behind my right ear to move my family to Dallas. So I sold my practice in my house and moved to Dallas, even though I didn't want to. I loved East Tennessee. Uh, I was very upset, actually. I didn't want to go. But I went. That's where I met Jane. Just phenomenal. I wouldn't have her if I didn't follow that one. But also, at the same time, my sister was having visions and praying and getting visions from God telling her that she's going to have children. So she starts praying to find out. This is right after she got married. She said, uh, she asked God on her knees, am I really supposed to have children? Or are these just children Andrew and I will have together, like adopt or something? Because for the last 12 years of her life, she's been told she will never have children. Uh, Well, anyway, she prayed about it, and then God told her, to move to Dallas, Texas, because your brother's ready to heal you. And that's why she came from Arizona to Dallas. So I made her my office manager after she told me what God told her, and I started working on her. Anyway, uh, we reversed every cause of her lupus and took her off all of her drugs in three to six months, waited a whole year for the detox from the drug she'd been on for 12 years, and now she's got four healthy children and is a mother. So that's that's why I became a doctor, was to fix my sister. I did not get my sister pregnant. God did it all and handled it all. But, uh, it, but it is phenomenal. It is funny. But it is the whole reason why I became a doctor was to actually solve the the why to my sister's suffering. So, that was it. So where did the spirituality direction go with from the Mormon church? And which direction have you gone spiritually in your life now? Yeah, good question. So... Spiritually, about 2009, when I was moving to Texas, I, hadn't, I actually had not decided to move to Texas. But uh, I actually was given the inspiration to put my house on the market and move to Dallas. So I actually went outside, put a for sale sign in, and then I drove away from the house the next morning to go on a family vacation for a week. The first day we arrived in Illinois, I get a phone call that somebody wants to buy my house, pay full cash, no, no, no negotiating, but we have to be in in two weeks. And I was like, okay, this is 2009. Do you remember what was going on in 2009, mortgage-wise? Do you remember were, the mortgage crisis the of 2008 were, The rates were horrible, and no one was selling anything. No houses were selling. And we put our house on the market and sold it in 24 hours. 
Mm -hmm. Full asking price. Had to be in two weeks, so I knew this was a God thing. (laughs) Where I was going in Illinois was to a historical church site of the Mormon church called Nauvoo, Illinois, where Joseph Smith lived supposedly when he died. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I went there thinking it was going to be some spiritual experience for me. Only it wasn't. It ended up being... (laughs) <laughs> Very uh, cultish, life changing. <laughs> no, actually, I got there and I wanted to go to the Joe Smith and Emma Smith's house. That's what mm-hmm. I wanted to see more than anything. The people who I've believed my whole life were like Moses, the modern day Moses is, right? <laughs> Second only to Jesus <laughs> in their home along the Mississippi River in Nauvoo, <laughs> Illinois. Anyway, I get there and I'm told I can't tour those houses because the Mormon church doesn't own those houses, someone else does. And I was like, what other church owns those houses? The reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints owns it. I was like, who started that? Emma Smith, after her husband died. Oh, okay. I've never heard that story in my whole life. Okay. Well, I want to go take tours of those homes. How do I do it? And the Mormon missionaries from my Mormon church, who were giving us a tour of Nauvoo, said the Mormon church does not recommend that you go do that tour of those houses. Because the other church gives you a film session for 10 minutes to give you the history of their church. And we don't want you to be brainwashed. And you have to pay $10 to go take the tour of those houses and the Mormon church doesn't want you giving another church any money. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I don't care what that church thinks. I want to go into those houses. I thought it was going to be like, you know, Christians want to go to Israel and go to the Golgotha and Mm -hmm. the the, uh, what else? Just, just travel on the same path Jesus walked, right? That's what they do. Yeah, that's what and they do. And it's a huge spiritual moment for them. I thought this was going to be a huge spiritual moment for me, only to find out that when I went and paid the $10, went to go do a tour, there was two homes of theirs, a little cabin, and then a, what was called the mansion house, where as converts came to Nauvoo, they lived there until they built their own homes. It's like a big hotel. Anyway, I walk into that, for the, that mansion house. There's a beautiful dual double staircase with a banister. And we walk in, and this young tour guide is looking at the seven of us, and says, and yes, everyone, this is the infamous stairwell. And they were like, oh. And I said. Where's the epiphany? I said, what do you mean infamous? <laughs> Wait, do you mean famous? And they said, oh, no, infamous. And I said, well, what's infamous of these, about this stairwell? And she looks at me and she goes, oh, you must not be a member of this church. And I said, I am a member of this church. I am a Mormon. And she goes, no. No, you're not. And the Mormon church has lied to you your whole life. And I said, oh, really? What's the lie? I haven't been told. Well, the story goes that Joseph Smith, Emma Smith, lived in the mansion house and were allowing people to stay upstairs while they built their own homes and got settled. This one young lady named Eliza Snow is allowed to move in there. She's from Canada. She's young, like 1920. And uh, Joseph Smith asked Emma, is it okay if she stays here while she, we try to help her build a house here? She wasn't married. A few months later... This young lady is upstairs puking her brains out in the bathroom. Emma Smith goes up there to find out if she's sick, only to hear this girl tell her, oh, no, I'm not sick. I'm pregnant. And she goes, how can you be pregnant? You're not married. And she goes, I'm pregnant with your husband's baby. We are spiritually married. (laughs) Well, Emma threw that lady down those stairs. (laughs) That's why they're infamous. (laughs) And then the trauma from the fall made her miscarry the baby. And I remember sitting there and I was like, what? I know Eliza Snow married Brigham Young later, and she was one of his 55 wives. I've known this from church history, but I did not know that she had had a baby with Joseph Smith. Mm. This is this is when I realized, is it possible that the Mormon church has withheld this information from me my whole life, and I didn't know it? And is this why Emma Smith didn't go with Brigham Young to go settle Utah, where all the Mormons went? Because Brigham Young kept, want, kept wanting Emma to join them. Because she was married to the founder of the church. Mm-hmm. She always refused and said, I'll have nothing to do with that church. Mm-hmm. She lived another 60 years, never had anything to do with the church. So I asked this tour guide if there was any other books or writings of Emma Smith. And there was two autobiographies that she wrote that included the time she was married to Joseph Smith. So I bought them both, and I read them both. I had no idea who I'd been worshiping my whole life. <laughs> Mm. who I've been praying about, testifying about, baptizing people in the name of for years. <laughs> I had no idea that the guy was a complete scumbag, mm-hmm. adulterer, whoremonger, thief, attempted murderer. I mean, everything. he's everything horrific you can think of. 
Well, really, even a murderer, because if the baby died, inside, oh. he, he murdered that baby. No, he would get teenagers pregnant and women who were married to other men pregnant, and then he had a doctor there to actually perform a abortion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yes, he is a murderer. Yep. Then he put out a, a hit job on the governor of Missouri because the governor Boggs of Missouri wouldn't give the Mormon church land that was already designated to the Native Americans. Wow. So he sent someone there to murder him. And the guy shot him through the window of his house, and the bullet hit him in the shoulder. This is the attempted murder of the governor. As a result, Governor Boggs of Missouri signed a, a letter and a law, a termin, a, an extermination order against the Mormons in the state that any, Mor- any Mormon could be shot on sight. <laughs> it wasn't even discovered that was still a law until the 1990s, and then Missouri got rid of the law. It was still on the books. So what happened then? So you're in this house. You're discovering all the lies that you were fed. And so where did your spirituality go there from then? Yep. So from there, I will just tell you, like I just mentioned already, that God spoke to me, told me that I need to put my house on the market. I have constantly gone to churches, to churches, to churches ever since. I have tons of preachers that are my patients, ministers. So have you ever come to a different faith yourself have you come to like a denomination of some sort no not not a denomination but have you ever then just said okay uh, how do i even i'll tell you what i've decided so after leaving the mormon faith leaving the mormon faith have you ever and even because because to me coming to another church is not the answer like the mormon church is the church right the Presbyterian Church is the Presbyterian Church. Have you ever just said, the heck with all that, I'm just going to go straight to the man, God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, his Son, and invite the Holy Spirit into my my heart to be the Lord of my life, and that's the direction I'm going. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, number one, I visited a ton of churches. Me and Jane went to a whole bunch of churches, even the ones she grew up in. And- I was really thinking I was going to experience some spiritual thing I needed to experience, like I was told I would have my whole life that I wasn't really experiencing. And that never happened. I have great respect for those individuals who are leading those congregations and the people that are showing up to those congregations. But for me, I actually have settled into and totally calm, totally fine, totally in love with having just a relationship with God and trusting that he's there for me as his kid. Mm Mm-hmm. And I know he still talks to me. I still know he prompts me. I still know that he guides me. And it's very obvious, even to the days leading up to this event that we're at right now, that he still does that. Mm -hmm. And he's going to do it. And he's done it my whole life, no matter where I found myself. He's always been doing that. I just think uh, God is way more merciful than I was taught he was. So with, with this transformation you've gone through then, did you go through a painful circumstance with your family of rejecting you because you left the Mormon faith. Uh, I actually have been told by my parents to my face for the last eight years that I uh, worship Satan now or I'm a Satanist because I left the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. My parents actually couldn't even say they loved me. They couldn't say hi to me. They couldn't greet me. They couldn't invite me to a family event. Mm -hmm. They forbid me to talk to any of my siblings. This is how that went. Yep. Uh, because they said I was too influential and I would actually talk them out of going to the church too. Well, I'm the oldest of five kids and it is true. I do like speaking. I do like educating, but it was never my intent. This has been my own spiritual journey. that had nothing to do with my siblings or my parents. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that my parents knew where I was Mm -hmm. and why I wasn't participating in certain church activities when they were going to be a part of those. But the cult of the Mormon faith makes, makes sure that the family structure is torn apart, That's just like Jehovah true. Witnesses do. And so at that point, you're cast out, pretty yes. much. Oh, yeah. You're cast out. So then, not only did you have the pain of being brainwashed all those years, and the pain of always having disconnection, but now then, it, it led you even further to disconnection from your or family of origin. Oh, yeah. But what's but very odd is, I actually will show up to visit my parents like every three to four months, and it's very weird. Like after about four months, I go, I think I need to go see my parents. What do you think, honey? And she'll go, Yes, you do. <laughs> well, She's and, very loyal. And I'll go, Okay, I'll show up, but I'll show up for a few minutes and I'll leave, or maybe an hour and I'll leave. But I've always been that way with my family anyway. I never, I remember, I'm the one that could disconnect, never really felt like I needed to be there 24 7. So they've always known that I was there and I loved them, and then I would leave. I love them, and I would leave. And but see, what you're doing though, Brian, is you're giving them grace. And see, they don't, they've never experienced... That's very true. They've never experienced true grace. 
I because know. they have not seen the true God Almighty who loves them divinely and doesn't lead them into condemnation through a cult uh, religion. And so you, with the love of Jane, show up at their home every three months reminding them of God's grace. So you are sharing the gospel with them, only they don't know it yet. I agree. And so the Lord has a plan for you and your family. It has been awesome. I will tell you, my si- I have one sister who also has left the church, and my brother <laughs> hasn't been to church in like five or six years, but he won't tell my parents because he's afraid <laughs> they're going to talk about him the way they talked about me yeah. when I wasn't around. Yeah. And it bothers him. Wow. Well, so anyway, well, that's, that's well, the I, story. I know that you have to get on an airplane. And so you have now been transformed unbelievably from being a chiropractor. And you, you, were ready, you retired, didn't you? I retired you? in 2018. Yeah, wow. I have to tell you, when I, when I became a doctor, it was simply to, cu- to cure my sister of lupus <laughs> is what I wanted to do. Well, that was, she got pregnant with her first kid in 2010. And after that, I really had no like, excitement about being in practice. I actually accomplished the goal I set out to accomplish. I was like, good, now what? But I kept treating patients, and it became very easy. Her story was very uh, motivating to a lot of people around the world that maybe they could live free of disease and symptoms. So we had 15,000 patients come through my office from 16 countries in nine years. Wow. I sold the practice at the end of 2018 and was going to go off and just create nutritional products, sell them online, and travel. That's really what I was going to do until I figured out what I wanted to do. And then God decided, I don't know if God decided it, but the world decided to create a pandemic for the world. And I had no idea that I was going to be sparked to try to save, like I tried to save my sister. I really feel like this need to try to protect as many innocent people around the world that I see as my brothers and sisters as much as possible. And I don't mind at all. I do not shy away at all from trying to be that leader for them or voice for them. But it has been this non-stop relentless spark of trying to protect and warn as many innocent people around the world that there is a lot of evil and men who are constructing and following through with that evil to incite harm and death to a lot of well, your people. wife wants to get to the airport in time so let's do this could you give us your website uh brian so people know how to reach out to you and you've got some amazing resources on your website so we do. would you share that with the audience yeah if you'll go to the d-r-a-r-d-i-s show.com the doctor artist show.com doctor is abbreviated uh, you'll find all kinds of resources for patient advocacy around this world we have advocates lined up ready to handle all the united states and canada you can get them there if you need their help. Also, there's resources there for protection from hospitals. There's a medical directive to physicians form, which is an advanced medical directive that tells them you do not consent or will consent to such things related to COVID-19. And then you have medical power of attorney forms, then research galore on how to actually heal the human body, what the body can use that God created and what God put on the earth himself that we can use to actually help Okay, so, so we'll put that website up, and I did, my husband and I downloaded those awesome. and got them notarized, so That's we can great. keep yeah. them with us now. That's awesome. Please so, do. Everybody does. Yeah. All right. God bless you. It's so wonderful to get to know you in safe travels back home, okay? We'll pray you up and know that you get home safely. Thank you. I love you all. Have a great afternoon. Love you.